Hi, I'm Marcus Fares, founder and editor-in-chief of Dezine, and I'm broadcasting live from the Dezine studio space in London. Today, we've teamed up with design and architecture firm LeMay to, to explore the question, what is Canadian design? I'm joined today by Leslie Jen, who's director of marketing at Supercool and fellow of Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. Hi, Leslie. Hi. And also joining us today is David Fortin. He's an architect and associate press professor at the McEwen School of Architecture. Hi, David. Morning, Marcus. And finally, we're joined by Andrew King, Chief Design Officer at LeMay and a leader of field work for LeMay's Design and Innovation Lab. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Marcus. Morning or good afternoon for you. Yeah, it's just after lunch here. So welcome, everyone. And since we're talking about design in Canada, can I start off by asking each of you to say a little bit about who you are and also where in Canada you're from and, and what it's like where you where you grew up? So starting with you, Leslie. Um, yeah, I originate from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, which is the Canadian prairie, vast golden expanse. Um, I went to architecture school on the West Coast in Vancouver, British Columbia, and I've lived in Toronto now for over 20 years. Um, I guess right now I, my, my professional life is split up into different categories, as you mentioned, Director of Marketing at Supercool, but I've just published a book authored a book that's recently been released and I do uh, writing for media publications as well. And tell us what is super cool apart from being super cool obviously. Super cool is an architecture firm in based in Toronto but has origins in Vancouver many years ago. Okay great and same question to you please David tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and the part of Canada that, you, that you're from. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so I was born in Calgary and raised in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, which is about an hour north of Saskatoon. Prince Albert is known as one of these kind of northern cities, but when you actually look at a map of Canada, almost all of our cities are fairly southern. So depending on perspective, it's north. Um, uh, I currently live in the traditional territory of the Tikamikshing and Anishinaabek peoples, which is in Sudbury, Ontario. Uh, and this is, I'm about a four hour drive or 400, 500 kilometers north of Toronto, uh, sort of on the northeast corner of the Great Lakes, uh, between there and the Hudson Bay. So, yeah. And tell us a little bit about uh, your work at the school. Well, uh, I currently am uh, teaching at the McEwen School of Architecture. Um, I finished my term as director in July, and uh, this is the newest school of architecture in Canada in 40 years. Um, and so the school was set up to, to, I think, explore what a 21st century architectural education should be, um, and with particular focus on northern communities uh, and smaller mid-range communities, which are often left out of the design discourse. So uh, we've been working hard for the last uh, decade on, on that uh, mission. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And finally, Andrew, tell us a little bit about your background and upbringing. Uh, thanks, Marcus. I'm actually currently in Montreal in, in the room that I'm in, and I'm in Montreal, as you said, Chief Design Officer for LeMay and leading uh, our research wing field work, but I'm also a Professor of Practice at McGill University School of Architecture here. But actually, originally, I'm from the UK. I'm a Yorkshireman, uh, and uh, I've practiced a lot in Europe and uh, spent eight years in Germany, spent two years in Italy, in Rome. Uh, so I kind of move around a little bit, but within Canada itself, sort of in the definition of Canadian practice, I've also found myself moving around the, the country, either th both through practice and through academia. So uh, working <clears throat> in small boutique practice in, in Calgary and teaching in Calgary, working in Toronto, working in uh, Montreal on some very large projects, which we'll talk about, I guess, maybe in my introduction, but I'm kind of an immigrant story and a kind of nomadic story. Uh, which is one of the interests I have in the subject, because I think uh, architecture is a kind of nomadic thing within this world. Um, uh, that's about it, other than, uh, other than the fact that I don't feel like an expat anymore in Canada. I feel pretty, pretty Canadian. Well, I def definitely didn't detect any hint of Yorkshire in your accent. You seem to have naturalized perfectly. Tell yeah. us a little bit about LeMay. What does the, the company do? Where is it based? LeMay is, uh, is the largest... Uh, privately held transdisciplinary design practice in Canada. So it's a very large firm. It, it has over 400 people and offices across Canada. So Quebec, Montreal, 
Toronto, Calgary, and Edmonton, and we have offices in New York. So we're a pretty powerful force in the business of architecture uh, on, on one hand, but we also have a really strong commitment to transdisciplinary practice and that I work with my landscape architects, my interior designers, our, our own engineering wing and our urban designers to sort of bring a very uh, inclusive and, and sort of complete uh, I guess, a uh, uh, solution to projects, but we also have through field work, a very, very strong commitment to, uh, to design research. And when we say design research, it's applied research, but it is, it is uh, purely research that somehow brings in various different components, academic institutions, uh, uh, some of our clients, um, different components within the world that, that we're trying to address certain issues with. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the presentation. So LeMay, LeMay is big enough to have many, many, tentacles and uh, and I run a couple of those tentacles. Okay well that brings us neatly on with your mention of presentations to the presentations part of the talk. Leslie do you want to go first if you could share your screen and tell us your take on what is Canadian design and explain what you do. Sure so let's see if this works. Oops getting ahead of myself here. Okay, so can you see this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so as I mentioned, I've just recently authored a book called Canadian Architecture, Evolving a Cultural Identity. Um, the aim was not so much to define what Canadian architecture is, but rather to bring together in one volume a survey of practices across the country whose work is positively contributing to the communities in which these projects are built. I find that most architectural books published are either collections of academically focused essays or monographs representing the work of a single firm, but instead this examines 33 firms whose work collectively addresses key themes that, while not unique to Canadian architectural practices, seem to reveal something about the preoccupations and sentiments that underpin the Canadian identity. So some of these themes are uh, reverence for site, landscape, and history, as Canada is geographically vast with so much topographical and climatic variation across its expanse, the architectural responses are regional and particular to those contexts. The rapid growth of our cities means that urban intensification and unique responses to housing better ensure sustainable and dynamic communities. Also, a strong social agenda drives many of Canada's best architectural practices and many of the projects featured in the book exhibit an ethos of inclusivity designed for diverse cultures, including immigrant communities and indigenous groups, which David will speak to in greater detail. The aging population is placing an increasing strain on our healthcare system. And the book introduces some projects that are excellent examples of supportive, humane housing and healthcare facilities. So this image here is the, is the title page spread of uh, Patco Architects, Odane Art Museum in Whistler, British Columbia, um, which reveals the objective of engaging and incorporating the particularities of the site and landscape in the design of the building. The building's form defers to the existing trees on the site, weaving its way through the forest. Its elevation on piers above the ground is a practical response to its location on a floodplain and has the added benefit of sitting lightly on the landscape. The constant view along the gallery corridor in this image reveals how the forest becomes very much a part of the immersive experience of the museum, a cinematic promenade of sorts. Its material expression in both structure and finish is also reflective of its West Coast context and the abundance of wood as a renewable natural resource in this particular region of Canada. This project is GH3's Borden Park Pavilion in suburban Edmonton, another prairie city, and embodies the very same reverence for site, landscape, and history. Borden Park is a designated heritage site that dates back to 1906 and originally housed all manner of activities, sports and amusements over 148 acres. Now it's only a third of its original size, but the park is still a popular destination. And this pavilion provides much needed shelter and restroom facilities for visitors. Like the Odane Art Museum in the previous slide, the pavilion defers to its leafy park context. It's 360 degree form, encouraging engagement with the landscape. 
you can see in the top left that the mirrored glazing dematerializes the building during the day and it virtually disappears amongst the trees. Additionally, the colorful history of the park was extensively researched as a conceptual starting point for the pavilion, whose circular drum-like form and surrounding pathways, entrance courts, and patios reference the meandering circulation, axial nodes, and structures that were once present. This slide here is um, an ambitious and idealistic project located in Vancouver's downtown east side. Um, by Henriquez Partners Architects. It's called the Woodward's Redevelopment, named for the site that occupies almost a full city block in which the former Woodward's department store once stood. A strong social agenda grounds this project and attempts to heal the community with a spirit of inclusion, socially, economically, and culturally, with a sustainable response that accommodates a growing population through urban intensification in the provision of alternate forms of housing. Beset by issues of poverty, drug addiction, mental illness, homelessness, and prostitution, the downtown east side has, however, not been swept up in the typical pattern of regentrification and displacement. Instead, it retains some of LeBlanc's heritage structures, bringing together an unlikely and diverse program in a mixed-use development comprised of market-accessible and subsidized community housing, retail and office space, for federal civic and nonprofit organizations, a daycare, and even Simon Fraser University School for the Contemporary Arts, all of which surround pockets of critical public space. A covered atrium and open plaza provide opportunities for recreational activity and social interaction, bringing diverse groups together in close proximity with one another. The last slide I have is uh, Shim Sutcliffe Architects, Residence for the Sisters of St. Joseph. It's a considered response to the issues of health, long-term care, and housing challenges for an aging and infirm senior population. The program comprises assisted living and a private hospital for a Catholic order of geriatric nuns. And these facilities typically do not feature such an exceptionally high quality of architecture. The project sensitively incorporates a heritage designated structure and skillfully integrates, improves, and restores the ravine landscape, a critical defining feature of the city of Toronto. Its serpentining form cascades five stories down the ravine, maximizing views of an engagement with the verdant landscape to promote health and the healing properties of nature. So in a nutshell, that's kind of, you know, a little bit of a, a sampling of what's, what's contained in the book and some of the themes that I felt were important. And, and emblematic of, of how Canada sees itself as it continues to evolve its identity. Great, thank you very much. If you could unshare your screen now. So you said when you first started talking about the book that you did not attempt to define what Canadian design is in the book at least, but if I asked you to define Canadian design now, would you be able to? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> And why is that? Because there isn't there isn't a coherent identity or because it's so diverse or what? Yeah, I think the diversity, I think Canada is a relatively young country with a less embedded sort of nationalistic uh, view of itself. So I think we're much more open to um, innovation, interpretation, just not cleaving to to prescribed ideals. And the, the projects that you showed as examples, was there any particular thread that links them all together or did you choose them because they are so different? I think, I think they are diverse, but I, I really do think again that adherence and respect for site and landscape conditions are, are a key part of most of the best projects in, in this country. Um, yeah, we have, we have kind of a deferential view to maybe what exists as opposed to what you know, we're always compared, it's a cliche, but we're always juxtaposed against the American approach. And instead of imposing our will upon the environment, I think we like to take our cues from it instead. I was going to ask, actually, do you do you tend to see yourselves as not being like your southern neighbor? I, I, certainly just answered that. I can't speak to everyone, but <laughs> definitely personally, that, that would be the case. Okay, thank you so much, Leslie. Let's go to you now, David, if you could share your screen.
Okay, thank you, Marcus. Um, so just to jump into this a bit, um, one th part of my biography that uh, I wanted to save for this is that I'm also a member of the um, citizen of the Métis Nation of Ontario, uh, which is an Indigenous group of people in Canada. And one of the reasons why I came to, back to Canada to teach uh, was because there was a new school of architecture uh, with indigeneity at the, at the core of its um, curriculum that had already been developed. Um, and I wanted to share that this in Canada today is not a totally uncommon space for learning about architecture, uh, and which is a relatively new, um, well, old, but new in the, in the architectural discourse. This is in a community called Batchewana First Nation, which is near Sault Ste. Marie. And um, in the image, there's an elder, there's a community member, there's a lodge keeper, and then there's a bunch of architecture students. And the theme of the studio that, that I put forth here was on the idea of listening, that the most important skill an architect needs to have is to be able to listen, actually. Um, and why they're listening is because it's important when we're talking about um, or questioning what Canadian architecture is, is that we, are, we have to acknowledge we're talking about a form of architecture uh, that is an agent of colonization. In the, on these lands for hundreds of years now. Um, and we mostly still live and design in cities that stand as monuments to land dispossession and attempted genocide of our indigenous peoples. So it's only really recently, I think, that we are broadly, and I say broadly, I mean in, in a kind of national sense, um, gaining an awareness about the uncomfortable truth of the relationship between the architectural and design professions and the colonization project. Um, so I really <clears throat> believe strongly that there's a lot of listening that still needs to take place as we, um, you know, move forward in, in, in this um, topic. Um, for um, many Indigenous people, um, the cultures, their languages, um, uh, their relationship to the land uh, is mostly not been part of, of broad Canadian design discourse. Um, instead, there's been imposed alien design priorities linked to essentially European um, and international epistemologies and methods. Uh, this is an image that I drew uh, in 2018 when I was trying to uh, explain why housing has mostly failed our Indigenous communities, mostly in northern remote locations in this case, but uh, it's, a, it's a similar story across the country. Um, in Indigenous teachings, there's a phrase that's called all my relations or all our relations. And to Indigenous people, this includes uh, not just human-human relations. This includes the water, the animals, the trees, the rocks. Uh, and like the human, uh, the building is but one component in a complex spiritual ecology. So land cannot be monetized. Buildings cannot be commodified or thought of as aestheticized objects that are designed solely as investments or sensory machines uh, without uh, causing a significant disruption to the interconnectivity that allows life, including our own, to thrive. Indigeneity is also not a, uh, an opportunity for kind of exotic visual representations of non-Indigenous peoples um, or cultural appropriation. Um, so it requires Indigenous-led processes at all levels. Um, and this doesn't mean that Indigenous thinking or teachings is exclusive, but um, th that it needs to be led by Indigenous voices. Uh, indigenous architecture in Canada, as far as the architectural community uh, was ever concerned, uh, was essentially on the left, which is our elder um, Douglas Cardinal. Um, and, uh, you know, he was uh, a trailblazer and a warrior uh, in a sense. You know, I want to point out that if, if someone wanted to graduate from university until 1961, uh, they would have had to renounce their Indigenous identity as part of the, ident as part of the Indian Act. So in, a sense, in, in essence, if you were to become an architect, you had to prove that you had been essentially assimilated. Um, so that's a fairly recent part of our architectural history related to what uh, Leslie was just saying. Um, today, there's a growing number of Indigenous voices in this space. We have about 18 to 20 Indigenous architects, but that represents about 0.2 of a percent of the architects in Canada. Uh, this group on the right was chosen to represent Canada um, in 2018 at the Venice Biennale. Uh, this was presented by our elder, Douglas Cardinal, um, and co-curated by myself and Gerald McMaster, who's a Plains Cree art curator. Um, and Inside the pavilion, the challenge that we faced at the beginning was how do we communicate the rich diversity of Indigenous approaches to design? I mean, there's no such thing as an Indigenous design because of the many nations we have, the many landscapes that we have. 
so we decided the most effective way to try to communicate indigenous thinking and architecture was through storytelling. Uh, and so the buildings were presented as one component of a living system, including, you know, these were all 10 foot tall um, videos of landscapes, um, voices. Uh, there was music that was uh, composed specifically for this exhibit um, by, you know, well-known Canadian Indigenous music artists, uh, including a couple of guys from a tribe called Red. Um, and so here we're trying to communicate that buildings are one component of the living system, of the living landscapes, um, and, and, and that the Indigenous voice is present in that. Beyond the more humble teachings of understanding what Indigenous design brings to design thinking, there are also some really significant questions uh, in our country right now that are rising. Uh, one example, and you can't see it great in this rendering, um, but inside that glass container is the former US uh, embassy, which is a Cass Gilbert uh, heritage building, which was gifted by the federal government to the Indigenous peoples as their new government space on Parliament Hill. Uh, it sits directly opposite the Parliament uh, center block. Uh, and the Assembly of First Nations asked myself and my colleagues, Aladia Smoke, who's Anishinaabe, and Wanda de la Costa, who's a Cree architect and, uh, and a prominent scholar in Arizona now, but from Alberta, um, what an Indigenous vision would be for that presence uh, on the site. And, uh, and so I won't go into the details of this uh, in, any, in any detail, but it created a real challenge for us uh, as, a, as a mixed group of Indigenous people to think about how we would define Indigenous design, Indigenous thinking in our country. Um, and so, you know, within that, I think that there's um, a lot of challenges that we face in terms of uh, the colonial infrastructure of the design world generally. Um, also, the, the sort of uh, confinements of, of the urban systems, including property, um, like I said before, the monetization of land, but there's also uh, some hope and some optimism to figure out how Indigenous people might actually see themselves in the built environment uh, in future generations. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you could unshare your screen now. And I read in your biography that you're actually the first Indigenous person to direct a, a school of architecture in Canada. I mean, we can imagine the reasons why Indigenous people have not engaged with architecture, but is that changing? And is that part of your role to encourage more Indigenous people to come into the profession? Definitely, yeah, that's a huge mandate uh, of myself and many others, and, and the numbers are growing. Um, we see Indigenous students across the country. Um, many schools have taken huge strides, um, including ours, but uh, other schools have taken huge strides, including in Manitoba, where there's a, a, you know, a very high population of Indigenous people in the prairies. Mm -hmm. Um, we're seeing, you know, for me, it's very inspiring. Uh, I recently attended an event for an architectural community where uh, Indigenous traditional songs and ceremony uh, happened, and they were led by young women, Indigenous students uh, who felt their cultures were important. Uh, and that has been, you know, compared to my colleague, Wanda De La Costa, when we were in school, I mean, I feel like she always felt she was swimming upstream, um, trying to figure out her culture's place in the architectural discourse, because there really wasn't uh, a kind of welcoming to that. Whereas nowadays, there's a, a, a curiosity and a genuine interest uh, in this. So um, there, there's a lot to be optimistic about. And you mentioned that architecture or, or Western architecture has, you know, has been an instrument of, of oppression. So how does the indigenous, how do the indigenous people that are coming into architecture, how do they deal with that? Do they engage head on with Western architecture? Do they um, bend Western architecture to their ideals or do they bring with them their, their own traditions and effectively start their own, their own way of doing things? I think it's a very good question. And I think that there's a mix of all of that. I think that in, not just the students, but even the, the well-seasoned architects understand that we were all trained in, in a certain way of thinking about buildings and materials and, and practice itself is still constrained by you know, material availability and sourcing and, and all, all of the kind of normal parameters for design. But um, I'll, I'll give you an example of, of a few that I think um, a moment that, I, that stand out to me. One was one of our Cree students in drawing a, a study of the teepee and building systems had done this kind of really beautiful collage um, where she actually included the text of her mother and the elder uh, and notes they'd taken and she collaged that into the drawing. And I thought for me, this was this really interesting, um, uh, she was letting go of the authorship 
in a sense. She was saying that what I do in my world uh, involves my elders and my teachers. And I think of it as an intergenerational drawing. Um, and I think there are these little moments that I'm seeing in Indigenous students and also amongst the amazing Indigenous architects and the way they're working um, that are creating a different sort of approach to architecture and how it expresses itself often uh, might even look like, you know, to, to other designers, like, well, I can design a, a curtain wall system like that. But that curtain wall system is embedded in it is a story that comes from the people. And when that community comes to that place, they see their story, they feel welcomed. Um, so I think architecture can shift um, into that place, more of a place-based narrative. Um, and, and in terms of Canadian architecture, there's incredible potential there, I think, for our communities across the country, uh, that when you get off the plane in Saskatoon, it shouldn't feel like it does in Ontario or in Yellowknife, that um, you should know that the Indigenous peoples of that place and their voices and their cultures are celebrated. And I, I think that's a huge positive for our country. I think people will um, will all appreciate that. That kind of place based you know the, the maori are leading this discussion nationally uh in new, in new zealand and the maori have continued to be role models for the indigenous peoples in, in north america or turtle island and final question for you before we go to andrew and to what extent did the indigenous peoples um hang on to their culture during you know to put it bluntly the, the colonial era um, did did they keep their traditions going? Did they did they modernize them in their in their own way, or were they kind of sort of encouraged or even forced to to leave them behind? Well, I think that that's a, a that's that would be an, an, a whole session on itself to fully answer that. But I would say that uh, again, it's a combination. Certainly, the attempt was there through the residential school system. I mean, that was a national government mandate to take the Indian out of the child. Um, and assimilate. And they, you know, they, they did everything about that. If you think about it, you remove someone's chi children and put them in your custody, you now have the parents at your will as well, because they will behave appropriately because you have their children. So a major disruption. However, um, yeah, when you get into our communities, um, and the, the First Nations uh, across the country, those teachings have been alive and active all along. The, uh, the ceremonies still take place, um, you know, the traditional dances, uh, the languages, although being challenged, the languages are still very active. Um, and, and so there's an incredible resiliency. I mean, when you look at the history of what the country went through to see how those cultures are thriving today, uh, also very inspiring. So um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a pretty exciting time for indigenous communities despite all the challenges. Fantastic, thank you so much. And finally to you, Andrew, if you could share your presentation with us. Sorry, I was doing that, but I had my uh, my my microphone turned off. I'll start again. Okay. Does that work now? Yeah, perfect. All right, great. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, David. I, I, sharing your memories of uh, working in the studio with Wanda and yourself, I, 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 it brought back memories to me. I actually taught David and Wanda in a, in a grad class at the University of Calgary, and I remember those conversations around around many of many of those issues, particularly driven by by Wanda's uh, sort of very earnest trying, uh, understanding of where architecture, contemporary architecture, was landing within her cultural world. So very interesting. I want to start a little bit though with a, a kind of note of skepticism because when we when we started this conversation, when we started uh, uh, working with Dezeen around what these questions could be, we ended up with a fairly naive, uh, what I think is a naive question about what is Canadian architecture, what is Canadian design, and I think your questions to um, to Leslie uh, Marcus kind of pointed in that direction. But at the end of the day, I think what we what we managed to do, I guess, is is uh, try and figure that out because I think we could say, and I think this group could say that we've been trying to figure out this question for a very long time and know that we it immediately expands beyond that. But in the first instance, we just put this little slide together. And when I say we, it's the broader understanding of the people that I work with and looking at what we've tried to do in the last 10 years around, uh, at least understanding how an architectural or a design practice can land within, within Canada and how it can find identities within Canada. So this really was our first thought about working across Canada and teaching across Canada over the last 10 to 20 years, but understanding that 
that that there's the, there's a kind of cohesiveness to the Canadian milieu that allow this to occur. And, and to your point, Marcus, about questions about the United States and our neighbor to the south, that behemoth that we can't ignore. I think this is something that's not possible in the US. And I'll talk a little bit about more about this. So I'm not going to talk about all these individual projects, but we have managed to work on Design Excellence Award uh, recognized projects, projects of many, many different scales, of many, many different uh, values, teaching across many, many different scales, exhibiting, disseminating within that world that is defined as what one group of my students now call in their in their thesis so-called Canada. But I think there is a kind of connectivity and there is a kind of link. So that's that's the sort of first first node. But within this work, there is a consistency about uh, uh, in this work, the work that, that, that we've been doing a, a kind of counter approach to a, a, to a regional perspective, and uh, Leslie touched on the regional, the, the ideas of regionality or, or, or in, the, in, the, in, the, in the academic sense, critical regionality, uh, moving across typologies and scales and, and geographies. Uh, and, a, and a consistency in understanding what is design excellence and what sort of formal strategies can actually inform that. Uh, but then there's also a consistency to say, okay, there is this thing. It is a pan-Canadian exercise. We are trying to work across Canada. We are trying to define an architectural design culture, but then also sort of consolidating those in a, in a thesis that then becomes a series of exhibitions. And this is an exhibition we did a few years ago at the Ryerson University School of Architecture. It really took all those projects, brought the, the it's, in, in one sense, it's a classic model. Uh, Leslie was at this show. I remember the opening. It was a classic model panel show, but in another sense, it was really about a kind of intervention of a broader transdisciplinary practice that brought a kind of manifesto and projects from across Canada and tried to link them through uh, the perhaps too earnest uh, um, uh, sort of uh, uh, efforts of a, of a kind of cross-scale design practice. But that attempt to understand what is Canadian really does become uh, part, of, part of this exercise and is important. Um, but I'd finish with this notion that there's a that I think there's a cohesive Canadian design culture. Leslie's book points to that cohesive Canadian design culture. There's no, I don't think there's a design. We can talk about it more. I don't think there's a language. I don't think there's a mentality. But I think there's an understanding that we exist in a world that has links to Northern Europe. It has links. It has increasingly and extremely important links to our Indigenous community, as David pointed out. But it, it goes beyond. Uh, uh, that that notion of what used to be beyond the colonial structures, you said, Marcus, beyond a resource economy. Canada is very much a resource-driven economy, and that was part of the destruction of our indigenous communities. Beyond the, the notion of limited cultural communication. So this slide is really about what we're trying to do next. The slide says LeMay by fieldwork. This is our research stream, and we're trying to take those qualities that we that we feel we've been developing and then put them into specific research armatures and then find a kind of identity within those research armatures uh, that, 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 uh, that, that somehow create a kind of position moving forward, post-colonial, post-resource post economy, uh, these thresholds, the digital threshold. So new apertures is one looking at finding new lenses, the commons, this notion about a collective understanding, circular systems, it's really about moving uh, beyond a kind of economical um, political systems to uh, to a more circular and sustainable systems. This does point heavily to the learnings from the indigenous community that David was speaking about. Digitality, and I call this post-digitality, the fact that, that, that we exist within a different kind of flatness of the world that's less about a, a kind of idea about nationalism or region, regional identity. And then for us right now, uh, urban metamorphosis, the shifting of our cities, both cities in crisis, but also cities that actually are going through these transformations. So I'm going to talk about three projects that touch on these research streams and, and try and get to a, uh, just to try and show what we're doing. These are all brand new projects in the studio that are trying to do certain things. This is the Tamil Community Center in Toronto. We're, we're working with uh, with the Tamil community in Toronto through a longtime friend and client and client of, of mine, Siva. And this notion that that there's a there's a a new way of looking at community that that embraces one thing that is. Uh, archetypally Canadian, the notion of a kind of mul multiplicity of, of cultures, uh, the idea that we're we're not a melting pot, we are a, a, a sort of multilingual, multilingual and multi-identity uh, world and in its best world. So this project really takes uh, 
some key drivers from the Tamil community. It's not just about the community in the center in the sense that it's for health, you know, so it's about, it's about, uh, it's about athleticism. It's a gymnasium. It's all, all these various components. It's a playing field, but it's, it's also a cultural sort of uh, fulcrum for the Tamil community. There's a museum, a library and an archive around the sort of, uh, I'd say crises, if not crises, at least the history of the Tamil community and how it found a presence in, in Canada. So in, in, in a sense, it talks about a little bit to my story as an immigrant, but it talks to a, a broader story about immigration and the diaspora and, and crisis. So this really becomes a kind of architectural expression around a Canadian story within the GTA. This is in, uh, this is in Scarborough, which is one of the most diasporic uh, cities in the world. And then talks about, rather than some form of assimilation, talks about an, architect an architectural projection of a community, while simultaneously hoping to embrace the other communities, the indigenous communities, the, the, the various other communities around a challenged, the, the challenged environment of Scarborough itself. But, this, but the architectural solution then becomes this notion about how can the skin transmit, the skin of the building transmit these stories and qualities? How can that central notion of the, of the courtyard, the fulcrum, become just more than a gathering space, but become a kind of symbol of that place? So for us, the Tamil Community Center is, is, is one thing. We're working in, in parallel with the Tamil Community Center. We're building stories around their language. We're building stories beyond architecture in order to move this project forward with them, in order to gain the funding for them. So for us, a kind of, a kind of project that's at the front of, of that agenda. The next project is very different. This is, for me, it's a little bit, uh, it, it's really a kind of self self-portrait or at least a self-portrait of my family and the and the art the engagement of, of, the, of, of Canada that we're trying to engage it's really a, and it's and it's a counter regional structure this is a house for a, a piece of land in Nova Scotia where I'm from and where my wife is from and it's really a place we know well and it's a place that forms a kind of kernel of a the critical regionalist culture a, a mentor and great friend of mine Brian McKay Lyons has developed a great practice around understanding that place but what we're trying to do with this project is find a, a counter argument to that, to say there, there are other methods, there, there's the more global methods, there's more broader understandings, uh, taking methodologies from Arta Povera, from the notion, the Roman notion of spolia, from this notion of a, of a kind of found object mentality. So rather than building a kind of pure expression of some sort of cultural identity, we're taking pieces, we're taking found objects, we're, 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 we're finding reused very large beams that develop the sculptural strategy, the structural strategy. We're developing every piece of, every component of this building is reused from some found artifact around, around uh, Canada, frankly, some of them are coming in from, well, if not all of Canada, but certainly Ontario and Quebec. But this notion that a kind of a, a project that is so pl place specific, and this is very place specific, it's on the edge of the ocean in a place that has a clear identity, can form another, ident another identity that becomes an architectural language. So this is a kind of a manifesto in response to that to that, what I feel is a sort of enclosed uh, understanding that in Canada, there's regional perspectives and those regional perspectives are the privileging of certain material and tectonic strategies. And then the last project I'm gonna talk about is probably our, our key project in terms of trying to understand how, how, the, how, the, how we move forward as a country, as a series of cities, as a series of places of identity. This is, uh, this is Place de Montreal A's in Montreal. It's a major public plaza. Uh, David and Leslie know about this project. It's one that's it's had some accolades and, and been published heavily and it's, it's under construction or about to be under, about to start construction. And it was the work of myself, Patricia Lusset, a landscape architect here at LeMay, and then our, our, our design partner, Angela Silver, who's a conceptual artist. From a process point of view, it really is fundamentally transdisciplinary where architecture, art, and landscape architecture are working cohesively. But its mandate was to actually create a place in Montreal for the women of Montreal. Place de, la, place de Montreal is, means place for the women of Montreal. It's a recalibration of the major public space in front of the City Hall of Montreal around the recalibration of, 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 of these voices. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the voices, but the, the, the fact that the city wanted to make this shift from that continual French English schism from that continual sort of structural idea in Montreal of what identifies it to this new language and then put it in such a prominent prominent place. So we won this competition with it was an international competition and uh, and we've moved forward with the project and developed it. The voices are the important thing and this talks to Angela Silver's uh, art 
uh, artwork as a, as a kind of fundamental component. The voices of this work are the women of, of, of the women of the his, women builders of Montreal. It's indigenous women of color, uh, a vast sort of swath, uh, nuns, slaves, all the, 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 the recognized sort of group that are being represented here. And in a very sort of abstracted sense, through Angela's text, through this notion that language permeates all women, but it can be specifically about these women in some cases, is something that's very, very powerful. This is fundamentally about the recalibration of, of, of the city. It's a fundamental story, I think, that creates a new Canadian context. And then just very quickly, fieldwork has a series of new trajectories that are going beyond this, but they are sort of radically inclusionary. This is Julie Pascuto's research that she's doing with a series of partners in the US around around uh, gender spaces, gender equity in spaces. And we've got a series of other regimes. But I think the, that's what I wanted to say just about this sort of notion of a kind of radical inclusion and a, and a, and a moving beyond the colonial and the, and the resource-driven world. Thanks. Great, thank you very much. <clears throat> so the, the idea and the theme for this talk very much came from LeMay. I wanted to ask you, Andrew, um, why did you choose to talk about is there, you know, what is Canadian design? Um, does there need to be a certain thing as Canadian design? It seems to be that all you were saying that it's very diverse. There isn't a, you can't point at a building and say that's Canadian. Does that matter? I think it matters. It goes back, it goes back to your question about the US because there is, there's political structures that are different. There's an understanding of the collective that's different. There's you know, we have a, a more socialized system here. There's a, a different understanding of what a national identity is. It's very different than that. So in a way, it's it's reactionary to what's happening to the South because it's it's difficult to ignore that. And it's very, very different. It has links to, to Northern Europe models. So yeah, I think it is, I think it's it's very important to David's comment about the fact that Canada, Canada is huge, it's vast, and there are many northern communities and they have strong identities, but fundamentally the population exists within a thin, a thin band, sort of adjacent to the American border. I actually think it's more important that we not that we define Canadian. Uh, design. And, and I sure I acquiesce. Absolutely, Marcus, we're the ones that came up with the question. And we had the internal debate about the, 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 the mechanisms that brought that question forward. And the fact that we should address it head on, knowing that we probably wouldn't have an answer. But what we'll, if we can actually continue to ask questions around it. So those questions uh, have recently embraced big, big uh, notions around indigeneity, as David said. Uh, they've embraced big, big questions about how our cultural identity exists within the sort of digital world and how we respond to certain elements. Uh, yeah, I think it is really, really important. And, and you know, we see ourselves as a pan-Canadian firm first and, uh, and then a Quebec firm and then hopefully at some point an international firm uh, at, at LeMay. But we see that pan-Canadian identity as being important and we're investing in actually making sure we can actually create stories across Canada. Does that answer your question? I feel like I'm, I'm meandering. I think that answers it very well. And, and is this feeling something that's shared by um, many people in the architecture and design community in Canada, is there a consensus that, hey guys, we need to start building an identity at, at the very least so that people don't think we're American, for example? Sure, and, and, and you can see cycles of that question depending on how much money the Canada Council for the Arts has or, or, or what the various initiatives are. You know, we, uh, I remember a, a Canada, O Canada uh, um, uh, uh, exhibition series that toured Europe in the 90s when I was living in Berlin. I remember these, these, these sort of, we, and I've been on programs where we've tried to move, we, you know, we represent ourselves at the Venice Biennial and we, we put some money forward for the uh, Biennial in Sao Paulo. You know, we try to project that we have the Prix de Rome, which I was, you know, I had the privilege to be a, a, a laureate of where we're projecting ourselves in the international milieu and trying to represent ourselves as Canadian. That's, uh, it is something that we continually try to do, but we do it in a very Canadian muted way, right? It's a very sort of quiet, humble, it's a word I argue with all the time, but a kind of humility driven driven way, whereas we should be a little bit more aggressive. Um, you know, the we have a strong presence of Danish uh, architects right now in Toronto, and we have a strong presence of Danish architects because the Danish government invested millions of dollars of projecting Danish practitioners into the Toronto market. And we in Canada should be doing that in other places, I think. Um, Ah, that's interesting. I, I, I didn't realize that that's why there was so much Danish activity in yeah, Canada. Happens by accident. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, it sounds like the beginning of a manifesto. It sounds like you're you're almost agitating for this to be taken more seriously. So what would be your next steps and how can you involve um, the other panelists on today's talk and the broader community? Uh, that's a good question. I love the word manifesto. I know it's a bit outdated, or it may, but maybe by maybe by the time we keep saying these things, it'll come back into uh, into fashion. But yeah, I actually think I've spent enough time in Europe and abroad uh, through various me uh, mechanisms to know that that yeah, I think it is something we should be doing. I think it is something that if we were to recalibrate our cultural voices, I mean, we do have one of the problems we do have related to the U.S. is we. There's, there's always the shadow of a kind of more conservative, more laissez-faire kind of understanding, particularly of culture in the world. So it's hard to actually put the programs in place that would help us project ourselves forward. And, you know, architecture still exists within a business environment as much as a cultural environment. So there are challenges of sort of linking the architectural practices together to create our design practices together to create those voices. Leslie's book goes a long way in doing that. It's the first mechanism to actually do that in a very long time and actually say there are these recognized voices and now we should project them forward. So I would suggest that it might have something to do with Leslie's book. It might have something to do with the greater presence of, you know, now that we're post COVID understanding that we can move our, our firms abroad. And it has to do with that we have to act somehow collectively as a cultural voice, not just a business voice, which is what the Danish government did very well. Uh, and, and projecting ourselves out of Canada into the other worlds. And I don't think it needs to be the U.S., frankly. I think the U.S., you know, the U.S. has its own problems and successes, but it's it's not necessarily there. And let's bring um, Leslie and David in on this. Do, do, the, do the two of you agree with what Andrew's saying? Is this something that you would you would um, support and get involved in, the, the kind of idea that there could be a kind of an effort made to, to make uh, architecture and design more Canadian. Absolutely. I mean, I neglected to mention earlier that prior to what I'm, I'm doing now, I was an associate editor at Canadian Architect Magazine. So the media aspect of things where I you know, really got had the privilege of seeing the best work across the country all the time uh, um, in that capacity. And I still do it. I travel abroad from time to time to Europe to cover some of the design shows. And it did seemed to me that very little was known about Canada and its design culture industry. So uh, as Andrew said, part of the motivation for my book was because of that, to, to try to draw attention to some of the salient aspects of Canadian architectural and design culture. Um, yeah, and I think it's time we should be a little bit more assertive um, within our own industry, but also, um, beyond and, and a critical part of that is is the lack of government funding that we have relative to other countries in Europe as like Denmark, France had also trotted out its its architects to Canada for a little little tour a, a few years back. Um, yeah, I think there's definitely room for for that. I don't know David's perspective, how you think that in how that can be achieved. Well, for me, I think that um, I, I do believe that uh, identity is an international um, topic and it's important. We've seen that through various countries in Europe and, and everywhere with nationalistic um, ideals politically and, and I think culturally. So I think this is an important conversation. Um, I think, uh, you know, relating back to the things that I talked about, um, procurement is a major um, opportunity and challenge. So on one hand, I would say that procurement uh, in Canada, we don't have, we talked about this earlier, uh, that um, there's not a lot of competitions, for instance. Um, so a lot of big projects in Canada require you to have, you know, a dozen $500 million projects done. Well, that starts to really um, narrow the pool of who's going to design your infrastructure. Um, so I think that's a challenge to, to, to create this. Um, but on the other hand, we also also seen a lot of government initiatives responding to um, many Europeans may not know much about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada, which was in 2015, um, which was uh, brought together calls to action from our Indigenous communities. Um, and what we're seeing is in the procurement uh, across the country, for instance, the Saskatoon Public Library, when they put out their RFP, uh, it was mandated that this building will reflect the Indigenous peoples of this place. Um, so it's, this wasn't a free-for-all for an individual um, 
uh, idea about what that library would look like or feel like. So uh, the same thing, uh, you know, is happening with Calgary, a new project in Calgary, Nova Scotia, the new art gallery uh, tries to express Mi'kmaq culture. So um, in some ways, we're seeing indigeneity um, and ident and place-based identities overlap, which I think is, is an interesting one um, moving forward. Um, on that. And again, I would refer to the Maori, uh, you know, the, the city of Auckland has adopted, I, I, I'm going to butcher the name and I apologize to any Maori people that might be listening, but something called the Taranga um, design principles. And the mandate of that, it says that every building in Auckland will engage with the elder community uh, through a process of understanding uh, Maori principles. And it says that we as a collective believe that um, our indigenous people are what give us our point of difference in the world, in a sense. So they're saying it as a collective municipality, saying we embrace our Maori principles and we're going to follow their um, methodologies in our design practice. So, you know, I, I, many indigenous architects across the country are looking at them again as role models and thinking about what the world would look like seven generations from now if design cultures really did um, start to uh, engage more thoroughly with indigenous peoples. And I was gonna say that, you know, one of the obvious places to start if you're looking for a, a kind of Canadian design sensibility or aesthetic would be with the indigenous people and, and their cultural output. Uh, are there any other ingredients that could be put into the mix? And this is an open question to all of you. Is there such a thing as a Canadian vernacular that was that came from um, the original settlers that doesn't have colonial links to it? Is there a, is there a, are there other, other sort of areas of Canadianness that could be thrown into this, this part of, of Canadian identity? I'll jump in on this just first, but I know Leslie has lots to speak, so I'll just do a very kind of blunt instrument thing on, on my history, which was essentially working in Nova Scotia with, an again, an architect named Brian McKay Lyons, worked within a critical regionalist realm. I understood that there was, there was a culture of building there that was very, very refined. It became very, very uh, uh, prescriptive to a certain degree. And that building culture came out of boats and shipbuilding. So you land in Nova Scotia, you're in a place that's covered in rocks, but then you decide you're going to make all the architecture out of wood. So you're going to go and find wood because that's what you know how to build. You know how to build boats. So then you build your houses and barns and whatnot out of boats. So there's, and that's a, and that's a, that's a story in Australia. It's a story in many, many places, but it's a particularly resonant story in certain places within Canada. And I think in Nova Scotia, it's, it's at the, it's at the, uh, you know, it's at the disadvantage to the indigenous cultural sort of forces at play, whereas on the West Coast, the indigenous forces are, are much more embedded in that culture. But that's my, you know, that is a kind of, there's a very refined culture that exists there. And it comes from not just a, a colonial, a partially colonial thing, but a way of making thing. And I think we, we still kind of, in that sort of Carlos Scarpa-esque sense, we, we still have a really strong affinity for that, that way of looking at architecture. Uh, but, but I'm sure Leslie has a, a much stronger views on, on regional understandings. Um, I was going to actually point out to what you just said too, Andrew, with, with you know, Brian McKay Lyons, you know, with whom we have a history, the focus on the vernacular traditional building traditions. But I think there's kind of a lot, it links with material culture. Um, and again, I'm going to come back to the West Coast in terms of the fact that, you know, BC forestry, huge industry, um, a lot of, I mean, a lot of how the best projects there are, are expressed in wood, such as the Pat Cow project in Whistler that's on the cover of, of my book. Um, I think that, let me just look at, I wrote some notes here about this. Um, let's see. Yeah, it's reflective of, of the climate, the natural environment, um, pioneering efforts and innovations in mass timber and pre-engineered wood products, I think is Canadian architects are making some headway in, in allowing tall buildings to be constructed. Um, there's a sustain, sustainable and renewable natural resource that can be locally sourced due to its abundance in Canada. Uh, reducing the building's carbon footprint. Um, so I think the, the expression of wood is probably 
Sorry, I'm losing my train of thought here. Andrew, maybe we talked about this. No, I actually think it's a great but... it's a great point. The expression of wood as something that knits us together completely. And, and whether it's innovation in wood, because I think we can, it talks about resilience, it talks about the indigenous culture to a certain degree, it talks about many, many things that link us together. I, it has links across to Northern Europe. It has links to, you know, uh, Scandinavian architecture for sure. Some some German, I mean, the Germans love wood. They just don't really know how to build with it, frankly. But but there's this notion about uh, wood as the sort of linking thread that's actually a beautiful story. It's, it's implicit in, in Leslie's book. And I think it, you know, it's a really nice way to sort of uh, to sort of bring the issues that we've been discussing together. Uh, we as, a, again, we as a firm, we see areas of expertise in wood construction, whether it's mass timber, structural, those sorts of things. And it brings, you know, the, the result is it's not just a technical solution. It's a it's an idea of building poetically and it's an idea of creating spaces that 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 are are, are poetically rich and to some degree, you can say of a, of, a, of a Canadian presence in a way. We have big pieces of wood here and we should be making things with them. That's kind of the, the and we are we're actually learning to do that and, and do it in a sustainable way. It is the sort of, I guess, the poetic remnant of our, um, of this notion of this resource economy. If we use this resource differently rather than making American newspapers with our wood and make beautiful Canadian architecture, then we're probably in a good place. This is part of my manifesto, Marcus. I was going to say that for, for non-Canadians, if you were to, to say, tell us what you know about Canada, then wood would probably be quite near the top of the list. There's a lot of forests, or at least we perceive that there's a lot of forests there. Also, it's fairly well known that Canada exports a, a lot of its wood to overseas. So there's clearly a lot of a lot you could do with that wood in your own country. Um, David, what about what about your answer to the question? What what could be the ingredients that would feed into this? Um, this idea of a Canadian design identity. Yeah, I, I really, uh, I, I believe in, in a bit uh, to, the, to the response to the nomad com comment earlier, but that regionality is so important. And, and if you look at West Coast architecture, for instance, um, there is uh, even from a non-Indigenous perspective, you know, highly influenced by the great Canadian architect, Arthur Erickson, but the, the kinds of buildings on the West Coast, even the condo buildings uh, over many decades have a certain identity to them, as opposed to the prairies where, you know, the prairies are much more, I would say, uh, economical, kind of, you know, agricultural, uh, modest um, and conservative. But also, you know, thinking about Le Corbusier's fascination with the grain elevators and those things, that's very much the architecture of the prairies, of the objects and the flat landscapes. And so, very much regionally, I think that there there are identities. Um, in in many cases, it's it's sort of um, vinyl suburbia, which is not helpful. But um, there are some examples. Um, and I wanted to add that you know one of my colleagues and now the the current director of the school, uh, Dr. Tammy Gaber, did a really interesting book on Canadian mosques as a Muslim woman. Um, and one of the things I thought was fascinating was she went to the far north, as far as like Inuvik, to visit the mosques in, 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 in uh, the, far, the far territories, as far north as you can go. Um, and I thought that was fascinating because, you know, if you look at traditional mosque design, um, typically those come from warmer climates. Um, but there was this whole issue when she got talking to me about it, about this small mosque in this far northern com commun community and, you know, the space you needed for your big parka and your boots. Um, and everything entering the mosque, a very different threshold condition than to uh, a traditional mosque. So how does the mosque land itself in a Canadian climate and work for someone that's, that's driving a, maybe, you know, a Ford 350 truck, <laughs> you know, in minus 45 weather? How does the architecture respond to a Canadian version of that use? And I think it's a, it's a little snapshot of the kind of um, Canadian architecture that can be viewed when we start to really look at where we are in the world. And, and again, uh, I'm a big believer that we, we get distracted by following international trends, um, even international detailing, instead of just kind of taking a deep breath and looking where we are and letting that inform our design process. And, and finally, I mean, it's becoming a lot of people are beginning to realize that indigenous communities around the world had a lot of the answers to things like environmental problems and mental health and, and lots of the problems we're being afflicted with today. Unfortunately, that knowledge got killed off or forgotten or sidelined or whatever. Uh, what, what about Canadian um, indigenous culture could 
architecture in the country learn from? Is it is it kind of the design and motifs, or is it is there space to to re-examine kind of spiritual attitudes and, and and ways of living that could actually not only help form a, an architectural language, but also help everyone lead better lives in in more in in harmony with uh, with the environments. I'll, I guess I'll lead off on that. Dick. Um, just, you know, I guess the way that, that I and others, uh, I think, think about it, it took, you know, 200 years for us to colonize. It's going to take a long time for us to re a, a shift. Uh, it's going to be a slow process in this. But um, I, to your last point, there, there's a, a quote that I often use, and it's done by the former dean of forestry at Yale University, where he talks about that he used to think environmental devastation was a result of you know, carbon and, and, and deforestation, all these other things. And then he says, but what he's realized over the years is that it's actually a result of greed and apathy. Um, and this is something that scientists don't know how to deal with. Um, and I often think, you know, yeah, you're absolutely right. If you speak to an elder, um, they do know <laughs> the answers to all of these questions. Um, and so I think, you know, it's systemic. Uh, it needs to be systemic. Um, there's an openness in our country. Um, I believe, you know, uh, again, as I talked about earlier, that if you're not thinking about your relationship to the landscape in a sacred way, and this is, you know, fairly new to me as, a, as an individual, even over the last decade, uh, you know, luckily I've been in situations to learn some of this from, from people who know this. Um, if it's not treated as a sacred relationship, you won't change your, your position in your relationship to that landscape. Um, and so, you know, again, if the world is commodified and commercialized uh, and monetized in a way that can, uh, that disrupts our relationship to the land, um, then we're, we're, we're very limited in how we can progress down that path. So, um, but I, I do believe the teachings are there and every elder I've sat with, uh, in a, you know, I'm, I'm not full first nations. My mom is, is, uh, is not uh, indigenous. Um, they'll say the teachings are there for everybody, you know, at the core, the indigenous teachings are there for everybody to, to find a better path forward. So um, that's what we're trying to do in the school here and other schools are trying to do is to say, you know, we start at that level education and it might take us a few generations before we, we figure some of that out. Well, let's hope it takes a little bit less than 200 years because I'm not sure we have quite that long. Um, but anyway, Leslie and Andrew, do you have any, any response, any, anything to add to that? I can I can just jump in. I think it's about land and water in an interesting way. It's and it's not just saying those are and it's about the fact that we've commodified those things rather than develop relationships with those things. I think uh, uh, one of the, I've known this. Uh, I've listened to talks from Wanda, the, the colleague that David mentioned, along from a long time ago, but also from recent associations. Really poetic understandings about the place for water and our understanding of the world. And then, of course, there's this fundamental relationship with the with, with the land as part of a kind of spiritual circle, a kind of spiritual understanding of place that goes far beyond this notion of the commodification of square meters of, of, of land. I'm working with fieldwork, is working with a couple of students right now, Grace Coulter Sherlock within fieldwork, and then two students at the University of Calgary. And they're questioning the future. This is the city in crisis thing where they're questioning this, the the value, because Calgary right now is going through some crises of land value, it's going through some economic uh, uh, thresholds, but what about trying to revalue this land, this moribund land, this land that's not being used through a kind of indigenous lens, and then answering some big salient questions about how we survive as a species or as a society around food resilience, around sustainability, around, around what our cities are going to look like in, in, in 200 years. It's interesting, David, saying there's a 200-year point to where we are now in a colonized understanding and what does the thing look like in 200 years? And that's the question I've been putting forward to these students. What would this look like if we push this through this lens where we have a complete, complete re-understanding or re-evaluation of our relationship with, with food and as such, the land that creates the food and the water that, that nourishes the food? I think there's an interesting question there. There's many more. My partner, the, 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 the partner who was on Place Montreal is, is of Métis origin, and she has many other more nuanced questions that she brings to her work. But as, as a kind of profession, if we just start addressing those two issues, I think it embraces a lot. Great. And finally, Leslie, do you have something to add? Um, I think they said pretty much all, but I do, yeah. I think we need to pay attention um, to the sustainability issue, um, landscape, site, history. I think that's... I mean, in essence, I've, I've brought this up before. I think that what really distinguishes 
that is really what distinguishes Canadian architecture from our neighbors to the south, for instance. Um, a sensitivity to these things. And I think we can continue to do that as some of the best projects in the book will demonstrate we're kind of on the right, the right path. Well, great. This has been an amazing conversation. I think the answer right now to the question, is there such a thing as Canadian design is no, but not yet. <laughs> Sounds like it might be coming. Um, Andrew, you, you mentioned that you you mentioned that it will be in my manifesto. You mentioned a manifesto. Does that mean that you're actually working on one, or you've just committed to working on one? Is this always, is this news? Like people know people who know me know that we're always working on manifestos around a specific thing. And I am working on a book right now, uh, which I've been trying to cajole Leslie to help with in some way. But uh, I actually think it, it uh, as, as we push through these thresholds and as we push through post COVID and we can actually start to, one thing, it allows us to recalibrate many things. And I think it has allowed us to recalibrate our stories. And maybe this is, I mean, I'm, I haven't, yes, I'll say yes. I actually think if I can find energy to push towards this thing and I can speak with my colleagues here and create the links you know, uh, field work manages through various connections to have links across architecture schools in Canada and across uh, resource streams for cultural stories. So I think it's something that we should push forward. And I guess I'll send the question back to you. If Dazim wants to be part of the manifesto, I would love to be part of that. So, uh, you know, I think that that would be a, a great way in which we talk about a I actually think it should be a manifesto. So you're actually, you've, you've now put that uh, burr under my saddle. I'll use a Western reference. I'm sure there's an English one. Yes, and it's on the record and it's been broadcast to, I don't know how many people around the world and we'll almost certainly follow up with a, a story about this. So it's, uh, it sounds like you've you've got yourself a job there. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you all so much, Leslie, that'll be, the David. Sixth, that'll be the sixth one, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie, David, Andrew, thanks so much for your time and for this amazing conversation. Thank you very Thank you. much, Marcus.